All right. Hello and welcome everybody to Teaching with Design, Taking Action on Climate Change. We are all so excited to have you here for this session that will focus on how to use digital resources and design teaching techniques to center climate change and take action within art, history, social studies, and STEM curricula. My name is Tess Porter, and I'm a digital content producer here at the Smithsonian Office of Educational Technology, which is a central educational office here at the Smithsonian. I'm joined today by some very special guests. Um, we have Alexa Griffith and Tiffany Luck, who are both educators at the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. And we have our extra special guest, Doris Sung, who is the 2021 National Design Award winner in Climate Action, who received the award for the Invert Self-Shading Window. Um, we are, or I am just thrilled to have all three of them here with us today. Um, so how are we going to dive into this topic today and what are we going to do in this session? We're going to do four different things. I'm going to start with an introduction to a platform that we're going to be spending a lot of time on today, which is the Smithsonian Learning Lab. And I'll talk about ways to find resources from across the Smithsonian to support explorations of sustainability and climate change with students. Then uh, Tiffany and Alexa from the Cooper Hewitt will share some really fantastic resources from their museum that can do the same. Uh, focusing on case studies and sustainability in design and design process activities to help students explore climate change and take action. Then Doris Sung will guide us all through a simple hands-on activity borrowed from her design process that can be used with learners of all ages and subjects. For this activity, in the coming week, we're going to release a learning lab collection um, complete with detailed instructions so you can replicate this activity with your own learners. We're going to add a link to this collection to the description of this video um, where you can find links to all of the other digital resources that we're going to be talking about today. You'll also find it on the learning lab, both by searching and on the Cooper Hewitt profile page, which we'll talk more about in a bit. Um, at the end of this session, we're going to end with a larger Q&A where you can ask questions of all of us. This session will be archived, um, so if you have to leave in the middle, if you want to share it with someone else, you can do so. As soon as the session ends, you can find it again wherever you're watching the session at now, whether you're joining us on YouTube or Facebook. So I mentioned we're going to have a larger Q&A at the end of the session today, but we really want this to be interactive. We want to hear your comments, your ideas, your questions, as we want to make sure that this session is as helpful for all of you as it can be. Um, so you can share your comments, ideas, and questions with us at any time during the session a couple of different ways, depending on the platform you're joining us on. So if you're joining us on YouTube, you can share comments, questions, and ideas at any time using the chat box, which you'll see to the right of the video at YouTube. And if you're joining us on Facebook, you can do the same using the comment box, which you'll see below the video. Uh, so to get us started off with uh, getting used to and experimenting with the chat, we would love to learn a little bit more about you. It looks like we have a lot of folks attending the session today. So please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, share where you're coming from, what you do, or maybe something you're excited about today. We would love to hear it. Um, so to dive right in, um, like I said, I wanted to get started with an introduction to the Smithsonian Learning Lab, which is a free online platform. Educators across the Smithsonian are focused on developing and sharing resources that center discussions and explorations of climate change and sustainability in the classroom using museum resources. And you can find many of these on the Learning Lab, which is the main education portal for resources at the Smithsonian. It's a free online platform designed for teachers and students, but available for anyone to use that enables you to discover rich digital resources from across the Smithsonian, create and adapt interactive learning experiences with them, and share your discoveries and creations with others. Um, the Learning Lab is located at learninglab.si.edu. I'm going to navigate to it now. I have it open in another tab here. So. 
Um, on the platform, uh, we won't get too much into the ins and outs today, but if you're interested in learning more, you can check out our Help Center, where you can find our Getting Started Guide and our schedule of upcoming webinars and our archives uh, that'll walk you through the basics. You can find our Help Center on any page of the Learning Lab by looking for the gear icon in the lower right, clicking it, and then clicking Visit Help Center. So on the lab, um, the site really centers around search, which you can use to discover digital museum resources like objects, artwork, primary source documents, articles, videos, and more, as well as collections for teaching made from those resources. Um, the best way to find items that support explorations of climate change is to start with that search bar. Um, so let me demonstrate how that works. I'm gonna get started with the search for climate, but it could really be anything. Um, I'll type in my search term here, click enter, and when I do, it's first going to show me resources from the Smithsonian Museums that are related to this topic. Um, so these are those um, items like objects, artwork, articles, and more. Like I said, there are also aggregations of resources for learning called collections on the lab, and if I want to view those, I'll click here. This will show me collections created by a lot of different types of people. Um, the majority of the ones you're going to find here are created by educators, both here at the Smithsonian, as well as others at other museums and teachers, just like you. Um, if you're interested in seeing what the Smithsonian has on the topic that you're searching for, you can use the search filters to narrow by Smithsonian created. It's right here under collection type. So if I click that filter and update my search, I'm gonna find 30 collections that have climate or center around climate. And there are a lot of different types of collections here. Um, so I can see there is a collection exploring um, climate change through artwork um, in this collection by the Smithsonian American Art Museum. There's a collection that explores the effects of climate change on coral reefs with the help of a National uh, Museum of Natural History scientist. There are resources on climate change activists from the Asian Pacific American Center. And there are videos uh, focusing on coastal ecosystems and the dangers of climate change from the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. So there is a lot of stuff here. As you search for helpful resources on the Learning Lab, play around with your search terms. Um, you'll also find really great and relevant collections using terms like sustainability, environment, and more. So with that, I would love to turn it over to Alexa and Tiffany to talk a little bit more about resources that are available from the Cooper Hewitt. Thank you so much, Tess. And I do wanna just take a quick moment to express our thanks to you and the Office of Educational Technology and, <clears throat> excuse me, and especially to Doris and um, for, for finding um, the time to, to take us through her work and this amazing activity that she's gonna share with us. We're so excited um, uh, to um, explore this with everyone here. So um, we, Tiffany and I work in uh, the education department at Cooper Hewitt. And one of the things that we are truly passionate about is finding ways that we can show how design speaks to um, important issues that we all think about and encounter every day. And of course, climate change and sustainability is one of the most pressing. And it's something that we know is discussed in different at different scales and in different ways at almost every point in the in the curriculum now, K through 12. And so, um, and of course, um, we are just one of the Smithsonian units that is is very invested in this. Um, and as you just shared some of these wonderful resources, there are, we can see some of the, the um, many ways that our colleagues across Smithsonian are also doing this. We are really um, speaking through the lens of design today um, and showing some of the responses um, that designers have had to um, climate change from the perspective of materials, um, looking at ways to um, minimize uh, damage to the environment, but also to stop it before it starts. Um, and this is why we are so excited to, um, to hear more about Doris and, and her 
work a little bit later on. So we have put together some resources uh, for educators um, and uh, on our, our learning lab profile page. And we can, um, in just a sec, we'll pull those up and we can show those um, to you. Um, we have created a whole range of things that um, include case studies, looking at one single project or one single exploration. Um, this is our profile page here. And so we have tried to organize it specifically for educators so you can kind of jump in and, and find what you need. Um, and climate action um, is the first widget that you see on the top. So these are, um, these are some of our collections that are specifically addressing climate change. And um, we can, um, again, go into this in a little bit more um, detail in a moment, but here we have um, digital self-guided field trips that are looking at green roofs. We have um, uh, monarch sanctuaries that are looking at ways for um, urban environments to protect and shelter um, monarch butterflies and provide homes for them. So these are some of just some of the collections that we have put together that really highlight um, climate change and ways that designers have responded to them. And some of these resources are really just case studies showing how they work and what they do. Um, and some of them are bringing you, you through um, a, a quick exercise, a quick hands-on exercise. Um, so this is something that um, Cooper Hewitt is especially interested in um, looking at from the perspective of our, of our collection and supporting designers who are working in this area. Um, I will say that Doris is, is the Climate Action Award winner uh, this year. And this is a new award for us that um, she is the second designer to be the recipient of this award. Um, and it's something that we feel so strongly um, about supporting um, and highlighting through our National Design Awards. Um, let's see. So I think we might be ready for the PowerPoint whenever. Yeah, just give me a moment and I'll pull it up for us. Cool, thank you. Tess, I think that we can jump right into the um, various types of resources, starting with sustainability and design case studies, if you agree, Alexa. Absolutely. We covered a, a lot of the... Awesome. Yeah. So, you know, Alexa shared sort of a breadth of these um, experiences and these resources that we've aggregated out of our um Cooper Hewitt resources and collections and different exhibitions, um, and we've we've sort of designed them in ways um, that the the resources uh, exist in collections that hopefully can help you the most. And you know, it's been so exciting seeing in the comments all of the different um, folks who are coming to us today. Some are coming as educators, some are coming as um, caregivers looking for resources for uh, families. Some are uh, coming as museum professionals. And so I hope that we'll be able to share resources that can help you in whatever way you're looking to tap into resources. Um, so one of the ways that we've um, developed some of these uh, stories of sustainability is in our case studies, which are deep dives on design objects. So a couple of examples that are in that widget that Alexa shared, um, if you would, yeah, perfect, is um, a case study on air ink, which is um, the image to the left on your screen. Um, and Air Inc. was responding to pollution in cities um, caused by carbon emissions. Uh, emission. So it was by um, the Graviki Labs that um, created a device that could be attached to exhaust pipes that would capture the particles of exhaust, but then went one step further and didn't just capture the exhaust, um, but converted it into water resistant ink. So sort of transformed and renewed um, this uh, pollutant into something that could be used for uh, literacy, that could be used for artistic practice. Um, so this collection is a case study on this specific um, on this specific design. Um, and it, it uh, allows you to look 
closely at um, the design itself and also the designer who created it um, and the different ways that it's being used. The other case study that we have in this widget is um, our Monarch Sanctuary, uh, which was developed in uh, response to the decrease in population of the monarch butterfly um, due to changes in urban areas to um, increase temperature changes um, and land development. So the idea is to create this um, structure that uh, is specifically developed to accommodate monarch butterflies and to um, both adapt to sort of a changing urban environment, but still make space for um, the natural world uh, and, and a more sustainable um, shared environment. Um, so those are two examples of our case studies, but we have uh, lots of different types of case studies, but these are two that are really exciting um, in terms of looking at how designers are addressing sustainability. Um, and we also uh, have uh, collections that are a little bit more hands-on. So in the form of, uh, we call it design it yourself. So they're quick lessons with hands-on activities. Um, the idea is that this would be something that um, can uh, you can view as a educator or as a caregiver or as someone who um, is interacting with students. Um, or honestly, they could go through it themselves. This is a resource that I, I believe that you could hand directly to a student and um, it navigates uh, you through a, um, an idea, a lesson, and then has sort of a, a try it yourself element. Um, so two of the um, collections that we've included um, in sort of this suite of resources is one of our design it yourself collections that is about designing a prototype for a user. So it's really thinking about some of those um, design practices, uh, but it it's specifically created to show how you might recycle and use um, everyday materials, trash materials uh, to bring your design ideas to life. Um, so to repurpose those as prototypes, as making materials, um, and to really think resourcefully about how you're using the materials. You can even see in this image, there's a few things that I pulled out of my recycling um, to, to kind of pull these ideas together. Um, another example is uh, our Design a Green Roof collection. Um, and it goes through examples of different um, architectural sustainability practices uh, that are, are happening at present um, and then has an activity with a PDF printout about um, guiding students how they could design their own green roof or um, sustainable architecture. Uh, so again, it's meant to be really engaging, really interactive. Um, so it does have elements of those case studies where it's looking at different uh, designers or um, designs that are addressing issues of sustainability, um, but then allows students to really get hands on with it too. And I'll pass it on to Alexa um, to talk a little bit about our designer spotlights. Thank you so much. So we do have um, some deep dives into specific designer projects. And um, the, the first, I wanted to just quickly share, the first one is the Gowana Sponge Park um, by D-Land Studio. And this is the winner of the first Climate Action Award from last year. This project is really looking at how landscape um, architecture, landscape design can contribute to um, cleaning the water in urban areas. And it's an, a really incredible um, uh, means of using landscape uh, design um, to really contribute to a cleaner city um, in, in a really exciting and important way. And Doris um, is looking at one of the biggest um, contributors to carbon emissions is architecture. And um, so design design is a part of the climate problem and, um, and designers and architects like Doris are making incredible contributions and um, making um, this, design solutions to um, climate change. And um, so I'm just going to turn it over to her because she's going to walk us through this wonderful activity that is showing us um, actually how this incredible self-shading window system that she has designed, um, how we can kind of bring some of the ideas behind this and some of the, the material responses and technologies into the classroom. So Doris, thank you so much. And we're going to just turn it right over to you. Um, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, it's kind of fun 
in a different way to do this on Zoom. Um, but what I'd like to start out with is just a two minute video, um, giving you an introduction to my work. And I think Tess can share that. Um, and then we'll continue after that. As climate starts to change and is getting worse and worse, our buildings seem to be designed to be capsules sealed very tightly from the outside. For temperate climates, we have to wonder why we do that. The moment I thought about changing my client-based practice to a research-based one was when I realized the products out there were really limiting. I wanted buildings to do things automatically, that to do it without energy, without controls, so that they can respond to the environment as it got hotter and hotter, how to keep buildings cool. The material that I work with is called thermal bimetal. It's a lamination of two alloys of metal together that expand at different rates. So what happens when the temperature goes up, it curls. Innovation is 90% failure. The first idea was to use it for self-ventilating that would actually ventilate the surface and open up like a basket weave. Another project was self-shading so that the pieces would actually start to open up and, and shading the area below. And then we also use it for self-assembly. Places like NASA have contacted me as possibly using this material on the moon. And we can also generate energy now. I designed solar turbines so that when the sun hits the surface, it basically makes a turbine turn indefinitely. We need more product designers like Dosu. The Invert product is unlike any other things that are out there right now. It just takes advantage of the properties of a material and our sun, and that has great potential for the future. We have some exciting projects in development. I have this idea that facades of buildings should belong to the city. So one of the projects that I'm working on is making smog eating panels. So the future has so much innovation and invention ahead for Dosu Architecture. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that, Tess. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of, of some of the things that we um, do in our studio. I have here with me Esther Ho, who has been with our studio for over two years now. So she knows everything intimately. And I asked her to join me so that um, in the case I need some assistance, she'll be, she'll be there for me. So um, what I'd like to first do is I do want to share one more image. Uh, I think Tess has, it's a still image to discuss what thermal bimetal is in itself. I think some of it um, was covered in the video. Um, but basically what it is, is it's two different metals or two metals with different alloys that are laminated together. Um, in the case of thermal bimetals, um, they're laminated by actually crushing them together. So they're molecularly bonded. Um, what happens is when the temperature rises, one side expands more than the other because it's more, um, uh, it has a higher coefficient of expansion than the other. And so therefore, when the temperature goes up, it'll curl and it'll go back and forth indefinitely um, when the temperature goes up and down. So it's a great material for architecture because it's robust. Um, it it's, uh, works endlessly. It will not delaminate. It will not change. Um, and it has the properties of any other metal that you use in architecture. And so what I've done is I use this um, quite a bit for building facades, building structures. I've used different thicknesses of it uh, for different purposes. My intent is to try to make buildings more dynamic and more adaptive to the environment, not only a daily basis from you mean morning to evening and night, but on an annual basis throughout the year, through the seasons, as well as with an interest or an interest to combat um, potential climate change, the changes in the temperature over time. So as, a, as our cities get hotter and hotter, our presumption is we're gonna have to use more and more air conditioning and these types of systems like the window itself um, will try to uh, 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 mediate that pro problem and reduce the amount of air conditioning um, automatically without wiring, without controls. So um, if maybe if you um, stop sharing, Tess, I can show some of the materials a little um, closer up or demonstrate them. Um, in the video too, we use um, basically three different thicknesses of the, uh, the metal. Um, the thinnest pieces are very much like foil. We use those in the window systems. Um, they just flip and they respond very, very quickly. 
Um, and the thickest material that you can actually see in this case, it's a little harder to see, I, I, you probably can't focus it, but it's actually very, very difficult to bend um, by hand, you can see. Um, we use in construction. So it's actually designed to uh, assist in construction. We uh, put it in ovens at very, very high temperature. They curve and conform to certain uh, configurations. And when they're curled, we, we push them into position and it makes it very, very easy to assemble. So it's uh, what we call self-structuring or self-assembly systems. Um, a few of the other ones I think you saw in the video, I'm just going to demonstrate real quickly. I think it was not that much of a, um, uh, a view of it, but you can see here in this case, let me, I have to move in the opposite direction. Um, you can see this is a self-assembly system. And so it's using, you know, I mean, tape, a lot of things that we find in our studio because we have to be really resourceful with what we have because nobody has done this before, keep in mind. Um, to put our things together. So I don't know, do you want to heat this up then? So um, Esther's just going to heat it up. She at, right now is using a heat gun. A heat gun is basically a hotter blow dryer. Isn't that working? So as the thing starts um, curling in the opposite direction, what happens with this kind of box and this is self-assembly system is it'll actually upright into a tall box or a mini, uh, like a mini tower. I think we need a little hotter to make it faster. Yeah. Okay. So you can see it wanting to stand up and we just have to keep making it sure that it's even all over the place and it will go. <laughs> Let me try it. Oh, there you go. You have to keep going on that side. Yeah. So there you can see, um, we use the gravity of the center thing to um, hold it down and to hold it into place. So we can make something very flat um, into something tall. And we can force it to go back down too. Um, uh, and then we make all different kinds of shapes, all, all different kinds of um, things. You saw also in the video, um, something like this, which you know, again, when we apply heat to it, we can actually um, open you know, the opening and you can see right through it. So part of the reason why, and we don't know where the application is going to be on this, is so that in buildings, we can have these, these oculus that might open up, let air pass through, sun pass through, all these types of different things. And so we keep trying to use this material um, in different ways. Um, so for the exercise today, what we thought we'd do is to try to make a bimaterial. I know that everybody's remote. Um, and it's an odd situation, so we can't share with you the thermal bimetal itself. But um, with everyday type of materials, you can actually make your own bimaterial um, to do some of these fun activities as well. And so I think it's educational not only for the art side of it or the design side of it, but it's also um, an understanding of chemical or material um, development too and how it works. So... Um, I think they're going to share with you several templates that you can use. You can see the templates are very, very simple. Um, they're all different um, types at different levels. Um, we have some that are at the beginner level. Um, you can see here, and we'll probably try to uh, include more instructions to it. And we have other sheets that are at the intermediate level. So I think there's a total of five sheets in here that anyone can play with, and we can show you what actually happens. Um, you, you do need certain materials besides these templates. So these templates can be printed on just any eight and a half by 11 um, type of paper, and it doesn't have to use any special paper whatsoever, um, but you will need other things. So the other thing that we found works is just packing tape, right? And we'll show you how that actually helps. Um, you do need some kind of um, pin. Um, in this case, we're showing. I'm showing you these map pins, but it could also be thumbtacks um, or stick pins, right? Any kind of pin that you can use to hold the thing down. Um, you know, uh, you'll see why we'll need it. Um, we use just standard pencils with an eraser because that's the way we can attach these things so that when you heat them up, things won't blow away. And you'll need scissors. Um, you will possibly and can use um, also things like pliers. Um, in this case, it's an awl, which is just, let me see if I can move it here, um, a very sharp 
um, pointed thing, but you can also probably use a sharp pencil. Um, and then we also have used any kind of um, straight wire or what some people call piano wire, just because it's stiff for one of the exercise, but it's not necessary for all of them. So those are the basic materials that you need to do this exercise. And what we're going to do is what we, uh, on one side of the, the by material is going to be the paper itself. Um, and what we do is with the tape, we line the other side. So one side, again, is going to be more expansive than the other. Um, and the other side will be a little more um, stable for expansion. So what I suggest doing in general is, and we're going to do, we're going to try to do this template right here, um, is um, basically covering the shape with tape. And when you put the tape on, you want to make sure that the tape is but not overlapping right to each other. So if you just cover it as much as you can with the tape, that would help a lot. I'm going to see if I can tilt this down to show you. Hopefully this will work. Um, and if you just take this out, I'm going to put it across here. I think you can see it. And then the next piece of tape, I'm going to put butt up against that one and try not to overlap it. And I'm also gonna try not to make a gap between. Uh, it takes a little practice, but um, can be done. Uh, and so I was able to cover the whole thing with two um, strips of, of tape. So you can see here on one side is the tape, and of course on the other side is just the paper. So once that is complete, then you just cut the pieces out, right? And so you just follow the lines that we show in this template, Esther actually put this together. Um, so if it doesn't work, she's the one to blame. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so you just follow these lines. You can just keep cutting around. Um, and you see the dark lines is where I'm trying to um, follow and keep going through. So once you cut these things, um, uh, what will happen is you'll have these two pieces, right? Uh, oh, so let's, can we show how this actually put together? What you'll have is these two pieces. Let me pull them apart, right? You can see that on one side is the plastic tape. On the other side is the paper is cut out. We even cut in these small um, black crevices there so that these two pieces can actually overlap. And what we do is we take these overlapping pieces and we rotate them together so that they're interlocking. I think I did this correctly. I'm missing a place. So this is where it takes a little adjustment uh, because you wanna line them up so that the hole in the middle is basically aligned, right? And once you do that, um, what we do is we use this pencil or the tip of the pencil as a place to attach um, the entire piece with that pin. So in this case, it's a stick pin. Let me get this back on again. Oops, I put it on crookedly. I, don't, I think it'll still work. It's gonna, it's gonna curl up, right? So you can see here with the pencil, um, it's just pinned to the top. We have our bimetal here. We've made these long petal-like things around the edges. And the intent and hope is that these pieces will curl up. So now we're going to test it with um, our heat gun. We do use a heat gun here. Um, it's a little hotter than a blow dryer, but you can also use a blow dryer to test these things. Um, and here we will demonstrate how this works. Let me, let me put this up a tiny bit. So you can see in the view, I'm gonna tilt it a little, you can see all the material curling. I think I actually bent this one. Uh, oh, actually what happened is the metal, uh, the plastic um, melted a little bit. So you do have to be careful for the plastic. Uh, but you can see how it's curled up. And if you let it cool down, basically it'll flatten again. 
Um, so we've made uh, a few of these templates. I'm just going to show you the template and correlate it with um, the piece itself. Um, the simplest one you can see, which is the beginner level, is this flower. Um, and you actually can make any different kinds of flower shapes. Um, here is the flower shape. And let me heat this one up too real quickly. So I can just show you how these things all behave. So I'm going to show you from an angle that the flower basically curls up, right? The petals curl up. Um, for another one, can I show, let's see. This, um, this is what we call the hairy clam one, you can see on this page. Um, basically, it looks like this. It's kind of, a, a, I don't know, a brush looking thing. Um, and what happens is all these pieces will just flare out at different rates. What we did in this one to make it also uneven is we actually um, added a piece of tape here and a piece of tape there to control the amount of flare so that it's not all even. And you can see how it kind of um, sp um, sp spreads uh, in a different uh, uh, formation. And then again, that will flatten out. Um, this one here, oh, sorry, I have to do it in reverse. This one here. Um, is a little bit different. What we tried to do is design one here that would start to curl around the pencil a little more. It's a little trickier, but it can start to do it. And you can see how it actually starts to curl down. And in this case, um, what we did too, you'll see there's these dashed lines that you want to fold it or, or, or prematurely fold it. And by putting that fold in structurally, you prevent the internal parts from curling, right? Um, if you understand structures at all, or like a piece of paper, this piece of paper is really flimsy, but if you actually fold it, and it'll actually be able to stand up by itself. So there's principles around that kind of structure and some of those forms. Um, there's also this one, which you see here. Um, and this one, um, the slots, we want to actually cut along these slots too because we want to force the curl in a certain direction. If you don't, it doesn't want to curl as much because the proportion system is really key too. And so when it's folded all together, it'll look like this. You see, again, um, it's all these pieces that are folded down um, and we then fold it into a box like this. And the intent is that this box will then also um, squash down, like her, which is the opposite of the, the, the thermal bimetal box that I showed you before. You can see it squashing here. Um, and then when it cools, it actually will go back up again. And then finally, um, I think we have one last one, which is also kind of fun. It's a little more extensive because there's a lot more cutting involved. Um, sorry, there's two of them on the page, but you only have to cut um, half of the page to get these things. But if you cut these page, this page, what you'll do is you apply it. Um, uh, sorry, you have, uh, I forgot to tell you, um, there's these holes on the top and there's holes on the bottom. And again, you can poke these holes with either a sharp pencil or an awl. Um, and if you one by one attach them together, you act, um, can put together this kind of um, configuration. It's actually really quite beautiful. So you can see each of these pieces is just using a piece of wire here. You can use a piece of a piano wire. Like I said before, the straighter, the better. Um, very, very thin, very simple. Um, and, and this one, uh, we're not showing on a piano wire. Um, but here's the cold configuration. Sorry, I'm going to put it this way, I think. Can it work this way? Um, this is the cold configuration where it's all standing up straight. It's still um, par um, partially curved because we put the hole, you know, the way that we entered the, the metal in the hole in the top and bottom is forcing the material to curl. Um, but when we apply more heat to it, you can see what happens. It's a whole thing. Oh, it's a little stuck. Can you hold this? Sorry. Um, let me do the other way. Maybe it's this way. That'll work better. Um, will curl, it's supposed to curl down and flop, but I think what, what we need to do is we need to make the holes on the top and the bottom larger so it's moving um, very smoothly and reducing any amount of friction. But you can see 
it become very squash is kind of cool because it opens up and then as it cools, it'll straighten up um, into its original configuration. So th those are basically some of the things that we um, like to do with materials. Um, in our studio, what we do is we oftentimes um, make the materials out of paper first or I or ideas. Um, we make them by hand by paper. We cut them by hand. Um, then we move over to laser cutting. We have two different laser cutters in our studio. Um, and from there, we then move to either plastic or other heavy duty materials before we actually get to prototyping and therm thermal bimetal. Thermal bimetal is really difficult for us to laser cut um, because you have to have special laser cutters bec uh, because they have a little bit of uh, iron in them. Um, and so lucky for us, we're in Los Angeles where the aerospace industry is very big and we have access to sending out for that kind of laser cutting. Um, we do a little bit of that metal laser cutting in-house, but most of it, for example, you can see on this very large thing um, behind me. <laughs> is, uh, sorry, my, that's my dog. Um, um, requires these aerospace engineering um, type of laser cutters that are huge. They're about 10 foot long beds and five foot wide, um, and they can do a lot of that <laughs> stuff. So the prototyping is a very big deal for us. We have a lot of different projects. Some of them you saw um, probably it is, is maybe 10% of um, what we actually do. Um, and, and that's basically our learning module. Um, I'd be happy to demonstrate more if you want or to actually go in more depth to some of these other ones, um, or we can just take questions. Thank you so much, Doris. That was incredible. I am so excited to play around with these on my own. And I am especially uh, excited about how simple they are, both in kind of the process and putting them together, but also the materials needed. That you can really just do this with uh, paper, tape, a hairdryer, and a couple other materials. And that feels uh, really transferable too, to not only a variety of classrooms, but a bunch of different age levels as well. Uh, so yeah. thank you so much for walking us through it. I think this is a great time to turn over to questions or go ahead, Doris. Yeah. I do want to add a few more things too. I mean, it's yeah. it, even though it seems very simple, um, it exposes giving me a lot of um, information too. So materially, what happens is you'll see that this won't last forever. All these things will actually start um, failing over time. And the reason why is because the adhesive is the the point of failure, right? So the adhesive will start to slip from the paper and it'll, it just doesn't want to, you know, it'll work back and forth, I don't know, five times before it starts to fail. Um, it doesn't happen with our um, thermal bimetal, like I said before, because it's molecularly bonded, um, but it's something that worked better in the beginning and over time work, <laughs> works less and less. Um, but it's understandable because you're, you're using disposable materials and, and inexpensive adhesive that's not meant to do necessarily this, but. That's so good to know. And I see somebody in the chat is already sharing that they want to do this with the design class in Long Beach State. Um, and they're excited about it. That's great to hear. So I would love to open it up to audience questions or even if you have comments or ideas on how you might use this with your groups of learners, please feel free to put that here in the chat. Um, we'll read out questions as they come in. And while we wait for questions, I wanted to just reiterate, too, that these templates that Doris shared and instructions for doing these activities will be available in a Learning Lab collection uh, later on in the next week. We're going to link to that in a bunch of different areas, so it'll be easy for you to find. First and foremost, in the description of this video you're watching now, which will be archived, so you can view it again at the link you're viewing it at now. Um, but we'll also make it available publicly in the Learning Labs. So you can find it by searching for Doris Sung. You can also find it via the Cooper Hewitt's uh, Learning Lab profile page. Mm -hmm. While we wait for questions, uh, Tiffany or Alexa, do you have any comments or thoughts on what we just went through? Well, I just, I have a follow-up question for Doris. Um, in the video that um, you start that we started the event with, and I'm paraphrasing, but I think you said something along the lines of innovation means failure. 
Mm -hmm. And I felt like that is so important for our young designers of all ages and skills to hear. And I was just wondering if you could say a little more about that, because to be brave and to do something that you don't know how it's going to work and maybe it's not going to work is so important. It's such a um, key part of, of um, this kind of really fun, fantastic innovation that you have, like that you have arrived at now. But if you could just say a little bit about that, I think that would be really inspirational. Oh yeah, it is actually mostly failure. Um, even to do any of these types of exercises that seem so simple, right? I mean, y y I mean to come up with these templates, um, we had to go through a lot of different um, forms to make sure that it was gonna work for this tape and that paper condition. Um, we threw out a lot of ideas. I mean, Esther can tell you, right? I, I, I would say, I mean, three quarters of what we do does not work. Um, and it's not until a certain point where it's like, okay, this one, this one, this one, or something is working, do we then start trying to develop it further and further? But our presumption is it never works in the beginning, but we don't give up. Um, what we do is we have a certain amount of faith because conceptually, as long as we conceptually think it's gonna work, it's gonna, it's gonna work. Which we're just ha we just haven't found the answer quite yet. Um, I, I, um, I, I use the metaphor of like an algebra math problem um, and knowing and having gone through it many years ago, um, you, you can't always get the answer so easily, right? You, you sit there and you're banging your head just trying to figure out how to do the problem and all the different steps to get there. Um, and what you learn over time is how to be resourceful about it. Cause sometimes you have to just back out and just use a different formula or you have to do it a different way or maybe you know this property in that way. And, and if you just keep doing it, you it's, it's like a math problem, you know there's an answer, especially if it's on a test, right? <laughs> if it's a test at school, you know there's an answer. And if you can't get it, then you're just not thinking resourcefully enough. And so a lot of it is just trying to figure out a different way or a different shape or a different form or a different thickness or a different, you know what I mean, way to do it um, and come back at it. So we don't give up. Um, we actually do, um, in some cases, keep a lot of our failures, especially some of the worst ones, um, just because they're almost comical when we look back at them. Um, but there is a lot of stuff that does end up going into the trash bin because we also cannot keep everything. So, um, you know, that I, you know, anybody, even when you're going to do this, you, you know, it seems so simple when you look at these sheets, right? And, and it's like, oh, well, you know, what I mean, that's obvious. And, you know, I mean, how come, you know, I mean, what, what kind of design is that, right? Um, but in our business, too, um, even once we design things and get something to work, we go through even extra lengths to make it as simple as possible. Um, so simple is very, very good for us on many levels. One is it's very efficient. Um, it's again, fundamental, I think, to math and nature. Um, and ultimately, um, if it's gonna go towards manufacturing, it also makes manufacturing much more cost-effective and, and uh, ultimately easy so that if it's easier to make, in the end, it'll be affordable and doable. So, it, it, I mean, preparing this exercise was great for us because we stop and we have to think about the constituents, right, who are making these things. And we got to make it simple enough that anybody, you know what I mean, can do it. Um, and that that is fundamentally how we try to think of a lot of our projects, right? We need to make them simple. Thank you for that. We have a great question here in the chat from Jan G. I'm just going to pull it up so we can all see it. Jan asks, when did you start thinking about creating this technology or researching it more? Um, that's actually a good question. Um, I practiced as an architect for many years, probably 15, 17 years. Um, and as an architect, um, we can only specify approved or certified materials out there. You can't just make up materials as you go. And so I was um, consumed, and this is probably in the early 2000 years with climate change at that time, thinking, wow, we're just going to, we're all going to die. <laughs> it was kind of this real extreme urgency to me at that time. And as an architect, I, nobody was talking about this. Um, you look at all the statistics, buildings are the biggest culprit and contributors to greenhouse gases and, and potentially climate change. And what are we doing? And so I almost I mean, was panicking back there, trying to look and look and look for more materials that we can put on buildings and there weren't any. 
So I decided to change my own practice, um, leave the practice of architecture and leave client-based work um, and go into research and, and start to, and try to develop materials myself. Um, so at that time, it was, I, I, maybe it was stupid, I don't know, it was a little um, impetuous, but I decided to um, start with um, smart materials because smart materials by definition are materials that react to um, the environment or, or changes in the environment without any wiring, without batteries, without energy, and without controls, with no computer controls to it. And I thought, this is smart. This is indeed um, what the word smart is to me. And if we put it on buildings, then we don't have to worry about them. They can operate, you know what I mean, when, energy, or when the power goes out or when the temperature rises or, you know, all these different things. So um, at that time, I looked for smart materials. Um, I also wanted to find materials that were robust enough to be on architecture um, and um, not unfamiliar to architecture. So um, using the metals um, was something that, you know, mean, appeared to me as like, wow, this is fantastic. It's something that actually has been manufactured and is used for many years. It's, the, it's used most commonly as a thermostat in a, um, or, or sorry, the coil in a thermostat. Um, so it's, it wasn't a matter of, of, you mean, figuring out all new manufacturing for it. Um, it was a matter of how we can then try to use this material and apply it to new things. So the dynamic quality of it, the specific combination of materials that I use um, works in, um, in temperate types of climates. Not, it doesn't need 400 degrees, for example, Fahrenheit. It'll start to curl at about 70 degrees Fahrenheit and will continue to curl as the temperature goes up and up. Um, and um, because we have detailing techniques in architecture that are already familiar with metals like this, um, I was able to capitalize on it. So um, that's how I started to use this specific material. But I also use other things like nitinol, which is a wire that shrinks when heated. Um, there's also um, smart um, plastics that are in sheet material um, that we've also entertained using. That's much flimsier. And I have to say I'm a little plastic adverse. Um, if I don't have to use plastic, I would prefer that. Um, and trying to look at how we can um, make smarter buildings, basically. Recyclable, I mean, thinking about the, the life cycle, thinking about wellness, planet wellness, human wellness, all those things. Sorry, that was a long answer. I think that was so helpful. I mean, understanding what your process has been, how you got to the point that you are now. And it makes me think too about really so much of what you've shared today is an opportunity for students to explore using design and innovation to solve climate change issues, but also take action. And so you walked us through how you took action. That's really helpful. Yeah, no, I, I strongly believe that design can solve a lot of problems in our world. <laughs> Maybe because I'm a designer um, and have been there, done that, but it, it can reach so many people, right? I, you know, if all, all the things that I do, um, we, you know, a lot of people ask me, oh, where'd you get your aesthetic? Or where'd you, you know what I mean, get your design sense? A lot of it comes out of just sheer geometries, right? And just putting together these geometries that that then automatically move forward. But the other part is as a designer, we're able to uh, infuse these decision-making parts at every step of the way. So it's not like, oh, I want to design this thing in the end and it just appears top down. It is so bottom up that each step you know I mean, the decisions of making each part, then in the end, when we step back and look at it, which going, whoa, that's, that's going you know I mean, kind of cool. Um, but the intent ultimately is to, um, to help the world, right? And to you know, make these things that architects can specify that they're affordable and available to everyone in this world. You know, like the last project where, you know, I mean, uh, Esther is, is working a lot on too with me is this smog project of trying to find passive ways to, to reduce the smog in cities um, just by using the architectural facades, um, by making these you know, fresh air pockets for people, um, and to do it so that it could be done anywhere in this world, not just in the U.S., not in you know, I mean, these developed countries, but um, using local materials and local methods. So design, I think, can do a lot. And so that's what I hope that everybody understands and that young designers can, can aspire to, is that it's not just to make 
cool things for rich people, <laughs> um, but to make, you mean, smart things for everybody in this world. Thank you so much. As we wait for additional questions to come in, for those of you watching, sometimes there's a lag if you're waiting for your question to come through. But I wanted to turn it over to Tiffany and Alexa again, if there's anything else that you wanted to ask or add. I can well, I want to thank Doris for that truly inspiring presentation and call to action. And this is exactly why we're so passionate at Cooper Hewitt about um, finding ways to connect design to the classroom. And we really hope that those of you who are here tonight or those who are watching in the future will try these experiments. And um, we'd love to, to hear if you do. Um, you know, we're always interested in, in seeing what, um, what our learners are able to make with our activities. Um, I do just want to say once again, we will have a learning lab up shortly, which will have Doris's templates and instructions. And so you'll be able to try it yourself. Um, I would like to see them too. I would like, to, I don't know if there's a way to share them or Instagram or something. Um, and it would be great to see what other people come up with too. There will be, um, we do have a hashtag Smithsonian, hashtag Smithsonian EDU that we ask people to share anything on. Um, and we've gotten some some great submissions in the past that so we're looking forward to seeing what wonderful things young designers make with, with Doris's project. Um, just very briefly, I do wanna say a special thank you to the sponsors of the National Design Awards without whom we would not be able to, to celebrate the, um, the incredible work of um, Doris and um, so we do want to just acknowledge uh, their support and the National Design Awards are made possible with major support from Facebook, Shelby and Frederick Gans, Helen and Edward Hintz, the Hirsch Family Foundation, IBM Corporation, and Crystal and Chris Saka, and generous support is provided by Kim and Max Schusler and Lisa Roberts and David Saltzer. So thank you um, so much to them for making programs like this possible. Yeah, I think the, the last thing I will try to add too, because I think a lot of people ask this question, um, is my own background. I don't think um, you have to be an architect. I mean, I, you know, when I went to college, I was a biology major and I thought I was going to go to medical school. Um, I had no idea that I wanted to go into design at that time. Um, but I did like to do the arts and, and I took a lot of studio art courses um, because again, there's that slight aspiration to be an artist. Um, before I switched over um, after um, undergrad and decided to go to architecture for graduate school. Um, of course, at that time, I thought I was going to be an architect with a capital A and, and design buildings and, and stuff like that. Um, but it was just being within the profession and looking and seeing the need out there. It might have been a little more entrepreneurial, right, for that that gap and finally it's like well i'm sitting you know i mean no one's going to do it so i was going to do it myself and it wasn't with the intent that you know i mean i was going to build this super successful business it was just fundamental you know I mean, trying to look for um an answer because sadly nobody was doing that and so myself being in education i um very much tried to promote these ideas for younger people as alternatives to um education um, and to think um, in, in, a, in a different way, innovatively and entrepreneurially of how to bring solutions to the real world. Thank you so much for uh, sharing more about your path and how you got to where you are today, uh, creating these incredibly inspiring, innovative designs. Um, it has been so wonderful having you here with us today. Thank you again for taking the time for sharing these activities with us. I'm also so excited to see what people create. And in the chat, just in case anyone needs it, I shared again that hashtag that Alexa mentioned. Please share your creations, what your students create on social media with us using the hashtag Smithsonian EDU. We would love to see what you create. Um, I think we're going to close off for today. Again, everyone, the session will be archived so you can watch it again where you're watching it at now. Uh, thank you all for joining us and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.